All right, we're going to do a little bit different of a message this morning. I don't think I ever heard one like this before, but it's been something that's been on my mind, and uh, I'll tell you, the Lord really showed me some interesting things as I was doing this study. We're going to start out in Galatians chapter 1. The name of this message this morning is the Gospel of Salvation for the Tribulation. Now, I've been over this in other studies, and I, you know, I... It's important to say it one more time, but this time period coming is actually properly called the time of Jacob's trouble, Jacob being Israel, okay? And this time period is specifically for the nation of Israel. It's to correct them, and we're going to see that in this study. But I just want to go over the warning here that Paul gives to the Galatian believers. Uh, It says here, verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, I have had this thing thrown at me because I do believe that the gospel of salvation during this time of Jacob's trouble, and I'm going to call it the tribulation because that's what most people are familiar with, but I've been called a heretic because I believe that that gospel is different than ours. They don't want to deal with the scriptures. They just want to say that, you know, they'll they'll throw this at me. So I thought I'll start out here with the attack that they're going to, you know, use on me. Now, I'm not saying what I'm going to preach this morning is not about now. It's about after the body of Christ leaves. Things are going to be different. Okay, Things are going to change. And you're, I'm going to prove that in this study this morning. Okay, And you say, well, how are we going to know? You know, This message I'm actually recording for people that miss the rapture. Okay, And you say, well, how do we know if the rapture hit yet? You'll know. <laughs> When you think about it, when you think about the impact that this event is going to have, it is going to be the biggest thing in history outside of the flood in the days of Noah. Okay, say, what about Jesus dying on the cross? Well, that's the most important event, but that's not the biggest event because there were people over here probably in America that didn't know what was going on over in Jerusalem. When the rapture hits, it's going to be worldwide. It's going to be the biggest catastrophe ever. You know, I was thinking about it. I've been thinking about it all week, actually. Just even just take one county in America, like especially here at Lancaster County, you know, there's a lot of saved people here. Now, what's going to happen if this afternoon when church lets out, everybody's driving home and the rapture hits? It's going to be a lot of wrecks. It's going to be a lot of wrecks. It's going to be a lot of unmanned vehicles flying everywhere. I mean, you talk about chaos, and it's going to be totally random. It's not going to be, you know, yesterday was September the 11th. And we remember, you know, nine years ago, the airplanes smashing into the buildings up there in, in New York City. That was one place. And it was chaotic in New York City. It wasn't so much chaotic down here. I mean, there was people that were upset about it. But when the rapture hits, it's going to be everywhere. All over the world, it's going to be reported. People disappearing, cars careening off the road, airplanes coming out of the sky. It's going to be very chaotic. So believe me, the rapture isn't going to hit and you'll not know about it. You will know about the rapture hitting. Okay. And then if right now I'm preaching this, this is September the 12th. Okay. And we are still in the church age. So I'm not preaching this for today, this, this gospel, but if, 2010, yeah, good, remind remind me of that. You know, this is not for today, but if this event happens and you come across this message, this message is specifically for you, okay? So I, I just needed to kind of start out that way. I am not preaching a false gospel, okay? I am, what I'm doing is I'm saying this will be the gospel for the time of Jacob's trouble. So what's going to happen? Revelation 4 through 5, is we're, we're not going to go there, 
But Revelation 4 through 5, you have John being called up to heaven. Okay, there's a large group of people up there, of saints, that are from every tongue, people, kindred, nation. Okay, they are there. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 is when the Antichrist shows up. So the Bible does teach a pre-tribulation rapture. And it, you listen to the other studies on that. Okay. But now turn to Revelation chapter 13. We're going to see about what the Antichrist does. I'm only going to touch on some of this because it's been covered in other messages. Revelation chapter 13 verses 15 through 18. You have the Antichrist showing up there in the early part of chapter 13. Then the false prophet shows up. And it says here in verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Okay, now we have a good message on that, the mark of the beast, taking the mark of the beast, where it's not just taking the mark. Worship is associated with it. Okay, and you see that right there. If you don't worship the image of the beast, you'll be killed. Verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. 666 is the name there, or is, is the number. Now, let's say you take this mark. Let's say you make it into this time period, you blow it, you miss the rapture. Okay, now you're in this time period and you say, well, the, you know, they require me to take the mark and I have to worship the beast. I'm going to take it, no big deal. Well, yes, it is a big deal. Look at chapter 14, verse 9. Chapter 14, verse 9 says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Just I'll stop there for just one second before we go on. Notice it says, If any man. Any man. Okay? Verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. When, if you are in that time period, if, if the rapture has hit and you are listening to this message, you need to understand that if you take that mark and you worship the beast, you are forever finished. You might not go to hell right away, but you're as good as being there. Okay, Your eternity is sealed when you take that mark and when you worship the beast. No exceptions. Now, right now, it's still the church age. Now, is there anything like this in the church age? No. There isn't any kind of a thing here that you can do that you're in hell, doesn't matter, you aren't going to get out. Okay, you have a chance right up until the day you die right now to be saved. It's Death is the thing that determines where you go for eternity. Okay, if you live all your life and reject Jesus Christ and you die, then you go to hell. But there are people that live all their lives rejecting Jesus Christ and on their deathbed truly repent and truly get saved. Now that's... That's a dangerous gamble to take. Mm -hmm. If you're still alive, the rapture hasn't hit, don't do that. Get saved today. Okay. But uh, look at verse 12. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now right there, you have the gospel of this tribulation time period. For the tribulation saint. If the rapture has hit and you're listening to this message, you're going to have to keep the commandments and the faith of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, I, you know, people don't do that. Well, there is one group that does. There's one group that is very, very devout. And we're going to be looking at them today. I've, been, I've always wanted to do a study on the beliefs 
of the Orthodox Jews. I, I never really understood what they believed or what they thought. And I did a study on it, and it's really just amazing. just brings to light what this time of Jacob's trouble is all about. And I'm going to be sharing that with you today. Just really some amazing stuff. But salvation is about two things. And you see it there in verse 12. Keeping the commandments and the faith of Jesus Christ. Okay? And of course, there's a, a works element there because you can't take the mark of the beast. And you can't worship, worship the beast. Which is going to mean what? You are the enemy of the government. And number two, you're either going to have to hide and survive that whole time or you're going to have to be captured and killed. Okay? That's just the way it is. And again, like I said, if you're listening to this before the rapture has taken place, get saved. <laughs> okay? It's a lot easier now than it will be then. But go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. We're going to see another verse here about this mark. The mark of the beast. Revelation 20, verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark. Now look at this. Upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's what you have to look forward to if you make it into this time of Jacob's trouble and you refuse to take the mark and you are killed for it. That's what you have to look forward to. And it's a great thing. Okay? It's going to be tough. But you'll be able to make it. And I'm telling you, there's... I don't want to get ahead of myself here. But of all the groups out there, I think some of these Orthodox Jews could probably make it. Gentiles right now? You know, there's there's a lot of, a lot of people in these big modern churches that are lost. They have never been born again. They're doing some kind of thing. They prayed some kind of magical prayer, caught up in the emotion of some service with all kinds of laser lights and everything else, and they're not saved. They're going to miss the rapture. They're going to go into that time period. They're already conforming to the world by going to these big worldly churches. They're not going to make it. It's going to take a, a type of people that are extremely dedicated and that will accept no compromises. And there are a lot of Jews that do accept compromises. But I'm telling you, studying this Orthodox Jewish system, there are people in that that they will, they will be tortured before they deny their faith, before they deny their belief system. You know? And right now, a, a Jew in the church age that gets saved, they have a terrible time with their family. I mean, an Orthodox Jew that gets saved, their family will disown them. You know, that's how strong their beliefs are. Those are the kind of people that are going to make it through this time period. Those are the kind of people you're reading about there in Revelation 20, verse 4. And I'm going to show you a tie-in to this verse. Okay? It says there, his mark upon their foreheads. Now, I believe, and it's been covered well in our, our you know, the message on the uh, mark of the beast. I believe that it's going to be an implantable microchip. It's going to be the thing that controls buying and selling. But I think that there's probably going to be some kind of a visible tattoo upon the forehead so that you can easily, you know, okay, there's one, there's one, there's one, you know. Oh, that guy doesn't have one. See? Now I'm going to show you why an Orthodox Jew would never accept this. Turn back to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19. We're going to see this a little bit later. Um, but a, an Orthodox Jew, their most sacred portion of Scripture is the Torah. Okay, the books, the five books of Moses. That's their most sacred section of Scripture. And the, the Levitical law, and I mean, they're, an Orthodox Jew will study the Torah every day. And they will, oftentimes the young men will go off to a university and they just dedicate themselves to hours and hours and hours of study of the Torah. And I'm going to show you here Leviticus chapter 19 verse 28. Very interesting. It says, "Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print 
any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Where was that again? Leviticus 19, chapter 19, verse 28. Oh, 28. Yeah. Mm. And right there. Now, an Orthodox mm. Jew, you know, a, a, a lot of these modern Christians, they have tattoos. Mm. And they, they, they're proud of them. Yeah, I was going to say that. I know that verse is often used as far as instruction and righteousness for today. Yeah. You shouldn't be doing that stuff anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Your body doesn't belong to yourself. It belongs to the Lord. Yeah. And you aren't to be printing things on yourself. And I mean, and you know, how is it honoring to the Lord? I'm going to get some big cross tattoo on my arm or on my on my face or something like that. I mean, a lot of these modern quote-unquote Christian rock bands, which is an oxymoron, there is no such thing. But these guys, you see them, they got tattoos. It's like they were, they're wearing sleeves. Tattoos there coming up the neck, you know. The worst one I ever saw, he had his head shaved. He, he was one of their, he, uh, this is out in, in Arizona at one of the big churches out there. Uh, he got his head shaved. Then he put a cross right on the top of his head. I mean, kind of right here at the top of the forehead, going all the way back to the back of his head. And then just above the ears from one side to the other, he had this cross up there. Mm -hmm. He's up there, you know, singing his modern praise and worship music. And oh, I did this. Sure. Thing. You know, to praise the Lord, I'm like, give me a break. And see what's going to happen when the Antichrist shows up. Right. And the Antichrist is a false Christ. He's a counterfeit Christ. Yeah. And he says, I want you to put the mark of allegiance on your upon your forehead. Maybe the three-pointed star or whatever. Who knows? But sure. They'll have no problem with it. But an Orthodox Jew will say, no way. I will not print any marks upon me. See, they're, they're already set up for this time that's coming. Okay, and we're going to get in a little bit later. I'm, I'm kind of anxious to get to that, but we got to hit some other things real quick here. The book of Hebrews. Turn to, to the book of Hebrews. Now, from studying this thing for a long time, I, I do believe that there are two books in your New Testament which are specifically for the Jews in this tribulation time period, the book of Hebrews and the book of James. Hebrews, obviously, we are not Hebrews. Okay, spiritually, yes, we are, you know, receive the spirit of adoption, I understand that. <coughs> but <clears throat> we are not Jews, according to the flesh, as Paul wrote about. And James, the very first verse, says, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. And you read through there, and it lines up perfectly with what will be preached in that tribulation. Okay, Hebrews chapter th uh, 3, verse 12 through 14. <clears throat> Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. You're going to have to endure to the end. We're going to see that in just a minute here. But I want to cover two other verses here, 15 and 16. It says, While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Now, I just want to give a little warning here again while I'm here. I want to do a little kicking, and I'll kick the NIV. If you have an NIV, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16 says, uh, let's see, I have it here. Um, it says that all the Jews basically hardened their hearts. All that came out of Egypt. That's not what the Bible says. Not all is what the King James Bible says. But you see, the NIV is a satanic Bible, and it takes a swipe at the Jews. And also in Hosea chapter 11, verse 12, we're not going to go there, but it says, uh, talking about Israel has turned against God, and it says, yet Judah ruleth with God. You know, the NIV says, Judah is unruly against God. <laughs> Blam. I mean, you say, oh, the NIV says the same thing as the King James Bible. No, it doesn't. They totally twisted it. They're turning the Jews against God. And you see a lot of the people on that committee, most of the people who translated the NIV were Calvinist. 
And a lot of the Calvinists have this idea that they are the elect and that they'll steal the promises from Israel. And that they are the ones that are going to set up the kingdom and the, the post-millennial. They're so messed up. Uh, but, you know, I just wanted to say that about the NIV. Don't use an NIV. Things are wicked. But now we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. Here again, I have a, a whole study on this uh, here available on Sermon Audio. Uh, you can also send our ministry, by the way, and get a CD copy of this. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 13. I did a whole study on Matthew 24, verse by verse. You can hear a lot more detail there. But it says here in verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You are going to have to endure to the end. Okay, if you mess up and you miss the rapture, you weren't truly saved. You're going to have to endure to the end. Look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So you say, well, Brian, you're a heretic because you're preaching another gospel. No, I'm not. If I was preaching it for today, yeah, I would be a heretic. But not in the tribulation. They're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, works plus faith and the kingdom is coming is what's going to be preached there. Okay, verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Judea. Okay, this is a time for the Jews. Uh, like it or not. Jump down to verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Well, when was the Sabbath day? When did it come back? Yeah, I got a lot of people, you know, there are a lot of Baptists, and, and I, you know, doctrinally I consider myself a Baptist, but I've had a couple guys on, on the internet, and they tell me that church age doctrine is the final dispensation. It's faith alone from here on out. And I, you know, I always debate that with them and just say, you know, you know, you're wrong on that. Uh, it, it can't be faith alone, especially when you hit the millennial kingdom, because mm -hmm. Jesus Christ will be here physically on the earth, and they really don't know how to handle that. But even in the tribulation, it's not faith alone; it's faith plus works. And right now, there's not you cannot prove right now for the church age that the Sabbath is in effect, but it will be in the time of Jacob's trouble, in the great tribulation. Right there it is. And you say, well, why is it going to be there? Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 19 through 20. I'll read here quick. It says, I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and hallow my Sabbaths and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. The Sabbath comes back. It's not in effect right now. Well, when does it come back? For those of you out there that don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. <laughs> See, it's a problem. The rapture is the thing that ends the church age. That's the event. And it's going to be a major event. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. We'll hit two more places here. And on this thing of uh, having to endure. Hebrews chapter 6. Okay, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now, this is going to be kind of strange. But right now, you have eternal security. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. And there are going to be a lot of fake preachers that miss the rapture and go into that time of Jacob's trouble. And they're going to be preaching eternal security. But you don't have eternal security in that time. And why are they going to be preaching eternal security? Because they're going to try to say it's okay to take the mark. You can't lose your salvation. You're sealed to the day of redemption. Take the mark that and honor Christ, the Christ, you know. 
Yeah. Don't be deceived by that. If you take the mark, you lose it. Period. You do not have eternal security in that time period. You do today before the rapture, but you do not in that time period. Do not be deceived. Okay, Hebrews chapter 10. We'll hit this yet. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. It says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Remember what it said there in Revelation 14? Those who take the mark, they suffer the wrath of God, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. There's your fiery indignation. Verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now remember, taking the mark of the beast, part of it is worshiping the beast. So you're going around saying that you have the faith of Jesus and then you go against Jesus Christ and take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist? See? That's a major problem. But now, <clears throat> I want to go over real quick here. What do Orthodox Jews currently believe? Okay? And like I said, this is some very interesting stuff. Number one... The Torah and its laws are divine. They were transmitted by God to Moses. They are eternal and unalterable. I would agree with that. <laughs> you know, amen. God has made an exclusive, unbreakable covenant with the children of Israel to be governed by the Torah. God has a co covenant with uh, the Israelite or the Is people of Israel, the Jews. Observing Shabbat by refraining from activities that violate the Jewish Sabbath and Jewish holidays. Again, that's a very sacred thing to an Orthodox Jew. And that's going to show up. It's going to show up in the time of Jacob's trouble. And this one here is very interesting. In response to the Age of Enlightenment, Jewish Emancipation and Haskalah, elements within Ju German Jewry, sought to reform Jewish belief and practice in the early 19th century. They sought to modernize education in light of contemporary scholarship. They denied absolute divine authorship of the Torah. So in other words, the same movement that produced Westcott and Hort and critical, the critical text and everything, that same movement that attacked the King James Bible also attacked the Torah. The Orthodox Jews went through the same thing. And a lot of the Jewish groups fell away, and they now deny the, the divine authorship of the Torah. You said German Jews? Yeah, over in Germany. So that whole German rationalism. German rationalism. It attacked the Jews, too. Isn't that interesting? Bible-believing Christians, King James Bible believers, the same things that we struggle with in terms of divinely inspired scripture, believing that we have it, the Orthodox Jews are hit, getting hit by the same thing. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Orthodox Judaism's central belief is that the Torah, including the oral law, was given directly from God to Moses. Okay? And it says here, I won't read the whole thing, but it says, it may no longer be changed in any fashion. That's what we believe, you know. We believe that you, you shouldn't be changed in the King James Bible. We believe it came from God. Uh, let's see here. talks about most Orthodox men study the Torah daily. I already covered that. Okay. Orthodoxy collectively considers itself the only true heir to the Jewish tradition. And then they talk about here unacceptable deviations from authentic Judaism, both because of other denominations' doubt concerning the verbal revelation of written and oral Torah. As such, most, most Orthodox groups characterize non-Orthodox forms of Judaism, Judaism, I'll get it out yet, Judaism as heretical. 
Isn't that interesting? Because we look at it and we say, you know, look at all the like the Church of Christ and the you know some of these other quote unquote denominations. The average church that you drive by when you're driving down the road, most of them are filled with lost people. You know, professing Christianity is actually a huge group, but believing real Christianity is very small. And so it is with Orthodox Judaism. Uh, let's see. The religious laws Orthodox Jews know today is thus directly derived from Sinai and directly reflects the divine will. As such, Orthodox Jews believe that one must be extremely careful in changing or adapting Jewish law. Orthodox Juda Judaism holds that, given Jewish law's divine origin, no underlying principle may be compromised in accounting for changing political, social, or economic conditions. In this sense, creativity and development in Jewish law is limited. <laughs> Again, they come out, the, these apostates come out with the TNIV, the feminist gender inclusive Bible. We're not for that. Oh, the King James has to be updated to, to match with our current culture. No, it doesn't. Well, it needs to be made more politically correct. No, it doesn't. And the Orthodox Jews believe the same way about their Torah. Now, they, they have their problems. They have their issues right now. They're going to have to be corrected. That's why the time of Jacob's trouble is coming. They believe in other writings, the Talmud being one of them. Very wicked. I would not use that. It says some very vile things about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Talmud is no good. Okay, They're going to have to be corrected. But their core beliefs are pretty good. They actually have 13 statements of faith that they believe in. And it's interesting too because the Orthodox Jews actually do not have a denominational head over them. They're all independent bodies. Autonomous. Weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Essentially, kind of like a Baptist. But it says here that I'm going to read a couple of these uh, things here. They're statements of faith. And then we'll move on. Number seven. I believe with perfect faith that the prophecy of Moses, our teacher, peace be upon him, was true and that he was the chief of the prophets, both those who preceded him and those who followed him. They think very highly of Moses. Number eight, I believe with perfect faith that the entire Torah that is now in our possession is the same that was given to Moses, our teacher, peace be upon him. So they believe in inspired copies? Huh. Uh, number nine. Read that again. I believe with perfect faith that the entire Torah that is now in our possession is the same that was given to Moses, our teacher, peace be upon him. Okay, God preserved the word. That's what they believe in. They believe in preservation. Uh, number nine, I believe with perfect faith that this Torah will not be exchanged and that there will never be any other Torah from the Creator. Blessed be His name. I believe with perfect faith that the Creator, blessed be His name, rewards those who keep His commandments and punishes those that transgress them. Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Hmm. Interesting. Number 12. I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, and even though he may tarry, nonetheless I wait every day for his coming. Wow. What is, what's going to be preached? What's part of the gospel that's preached? The gospel of the kingdom. They're waiting for it. Some are going to be deceived. They're going to, re they're going to think that the Antichrist is the right guy. But I think some of them are going to wake up to it. A lot of them are going to wake up. Now, let's say, okay, we read in Revelation, they have to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, how is that going to be accomplished? Now, after the rapture, it's going to be a pretty amazing event. And the news media is going to do something to cover that up. I don't know what it's going to be. But they're going to do something to cover it up. So at what point, do the Jews, these Orthodox Jews, at what point are they going to start believing in Jesus Christ? What would it take for them to believe in Jesus Christ? Well, who could preach Jesus to them? Could Jesus preach to these people? No. They wouldn't receive Jesus. They didn't receive him back then. 
What about Paul? What if God resurrected Paul and brought him back? No, (laughs) they don't think too highly of Paul either. How about Peter, John, Matthew, Mark, or Luke? They'd say, oh, you know, you've gone to the Gentiles. You know, you're Jewish, yes, but you've gone to the Gentiles. How about Mary? (laughs) Uh, I don't think so. (laughs) What about Moses? They just said that they regard Moses as the greatest of all. The Torah, the books of Moses. Let's let's go, and I want to show you this real quick here. Acts chapter 6. This is where it starts to get interesting. Because you're going to see that this whole thing, the Lord has this thing worked out. It's just amazing. Acts chapter 6, verse 9. You're going to see some personal testimony here of some, of some Jews and what they think. Okay, here you have Stephen speaking to the Jews. And it says here in verse 9, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen, Stephen, excuse me, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suburned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. We aren't going to read chapter 7 there, but of course if you know the story, uh, Stephen gets killed. <laughs> they, they martyr him. Okay, They didn't accept the, the, testimony, the testimony of a saved Jew. They didn't accept Jesus Christ. But what was holy to them? Moses. Now wouldn't it be nice if there was some way that Moses could preach to the Jews? Turn to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. We're going to see what happens here. Revelation 11 verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. What did Moses do when he was bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. Right there. Verse 6. He did those same things. And he's going to perform them again in the future. And I'm going to show you that these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. We'll get into that as we continue here. Okay. Verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Remember that for later. Verse 9. And they of the people in kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and an half, and shall suffer their dead bodies to be put, shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. You know, a lot of these modern professing Christians get offended at street preachers today. If they mess up and miss the rapture and they make it into this time period and you get these two prophets going around 
calls on water to turn to blood and plagues to hit the earth, do you think that these modern Christians are going to listen to them? <laughs> Hardly. Who will? If this is Moses and Elijah, and I believe it is, who's going to listen? The Jews seek a sign. The Jews seek a sign. So you have them coming with signs, but you also have them realizing this is Moses. Moses came back. I heard an interesting story the one time, uh, the uh, movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. He was over there in Jerusalem, and they dressed him up like Moses for the movie. And he said he would he was walking in different areas, and he said the Jews would stop what they were doing, and they'd just stare at him. And they'd, they'd be going, Moses, Moses, you know. Oh, yeah. They think very highly of Moses. And what a perfect man to bring back in that time and preach to these people. And I'll tell you what, you want to do something interesting sometime, read the book of Hebrews and imagine Moses and Elijah preaching that to the to the Jewish people. Makes perfect sense. Talking about your fathers in the wilderness and your fathers in the you know. It's being preached to Jews. That would be the perfect book to preach to these people. Okay. Now I want to show you something else that's kind of interesting here. Hebrews chapter 11. This is uh would be perfect to be preached to the Jews in that time period. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 23 says here, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Hmm. That could come in handy during the tribulation. Very handy. Is the Antichrist going to be considered a king? Absolutely. Yeah. And you shouldn't be afraid of his commandment if you're in that time period. Verse 24, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You take that mark of the beast, you might think you're getting away with it, but that's a sin and it's only going to be for a season. And Moses is going to suffer affliction with the people of God. Who are the people of God? It's the Jews. It's right there. Verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Hmm. The reproach of Christ. Moses having the reproach of Christ. When does that happen? It will in the time of Jacob's trouble. Big time. And it says about then the treasures in Egypt. What did we just read over there in Revelation? that Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt. What did Moses do for the children of Israel in the Old Testament? He brought them out of Egypt. What's he going to do for the children of Israel in the future? When you see the desolation of abomination standing in the holy place, flee. It's right there. And I'm going to tell you right now, I can see some of this stuff in the Scripture. Okay? But I'm in a dispensation the church age dispensation, looking forward into this time period, it's kind of hazy. I'm not going to understand it. I'm not going to have perfect wisdom. So I'm not going to say a whole lot because the Lord's not really going to reveal a lot of this stuff until that time period shows up. Okay? It's going to be a lot clearer then. So I'm going to be careful how much of this I, I talk about. Okay? Uh, now... Let's go back to Deuteronomy. You say, well, what about, you know, how are the Jews, are they going to receive Moses? You know, when he shows up. Well, I'm going to show you something here very interesting, and then we'll, we'll end this study. Deuteronomy chapter 34, the very last chapter of Deuteronomy. And this, this is very, very interesting. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 34. Verse 1, And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountains of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead, and unto Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, 
and Manasseh, and all the lands of Judah, unto the utmost sea, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zoar. Now, the Jews don't currently have all of that land. But look what the Lord says here, verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. Moses had sinned. Okay, we aren't going to get into all that, but he had sinned. He wasn't going in. But God said, This is the land that I swear. He didn't say, Maybe if, you know, you know, he swore that he would give it to them. And you have all these people, oh, this Zionist thing, and, you know, that, oh, you know, they aren't going to receive. God promised it. He swore an oath. They're going to get it. And he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. Listen to the message, the premillennial thing. Verse 5. So Mo Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab. Who buried Moses? God. God. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if there are any other men ever that God himself buried. Now, why did God bury him? We're going to get into that in just a little bit. Over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulchral, sepulcher excuse me, unto this day. No man knoweth of his sepulcher. Where's Moses buried? You go over to Jerusalem and you go up to an Orthodox Jew, a rabbi or whatever, and you say, uh, excuse me, where's Moses, Moses buried? I don't know. What's the reason for that? I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, verse uh, 7. And Moses was an hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, and nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent to him, sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land in all that mighty hand in all that mighty hand and all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel it's going to happen again in the time of Jacob's trouble okay uh, what about Elijah uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. I'll read it quick. You don't have to turn there. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, Elijah and Elisha, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah was caught up. He never died. So you have Moses dying, but nobody knows where he was buried. God buried. Elijah was caught up without dying. So you can't say, Moses and Elijah, no, it can't be you. You're buried right over there. See? If they had some place that was a, a holy shrine, this is where Moses was buried. The Bible says right where he was married, or buried. And this is where Elijah you know, was buried. It'd be real tough to convince people that you're there, standing there. I mean, yeah, you know, God could resurrect them. But the fact is, I think that God kept these two men, the, the burial place of them, there's no body that you can go to for a very specific reason. Now, let me show you something else that's very interesting. Uh, Jude 9. I actually heard this this week and I thought, you know, that's pretty incredible. A lot of scripture this morning. There's only a couple more places to turn to. And then we're done. Jude verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Why did the devil want Moses' body? It's an interesting question, isn't it? 
Because you see, if the devil had his body, he could have made some special shrine where he was buried. And they wouldn't have accepted his witness when he came back. Okay? Um, we are going to turn there for sake of time. But Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 through 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 10. You have the Mount of Transfiguration. Who shows up? Moses and Elijah. And what does Peter, good old put your foot in your mouth Peter, what does he say? Let's build a temple. Three, three, three temples. Tabernacles. tabernacles, yeah. Let's build them here. One for Moses, one for Elijah. <laughs> no, no, Peter. Not a good idea. Okay. Uh, Malachi chapter 4. This last place we'll turn to. The last book in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4. I have a testimony of a of a converted Jew, uh, Ben David Liu. His name is. He was down at uh, uh, Ruckman's Church, Doctor Ruckman's Church, a number of years ago. Very interesting testimony. He survived the Holocaust, went through, and and he became a Jewish rabbi. Ended up getting saved, and uh, just really interesting guy. And he said that. You know, people say about, uh, do you convert Jews? And he said, no, I don't. I complete them. <laughs> they have the Old Testament. They have the Orthodox Jews. They have the same beliefs in many areas as we do as Bible believers. But they just need that completed. They're looking for the Messiah. They don't realize. And a lot of them, I'm telling you, a lot of them, I believe it's because of their leaders. The rabbis that are keeping the truth from them. And you hear his testimony. He was asked by a young man. He said, when I die, where do I go? And Ben David Liu was like, um, well, you go kind of to Abraham's bosom and you have to be prayed out you know, by your sons. And he said, what if I die before I have sons? <laughs> Good question. You know, and then, you know, it, it basically led him to Isaiah chapter 53 which they try to avoid. An Orthodox Jew tries to avoid Isaiah 53. And then that led him to a study of the book of John, and that led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but that's what they're waiting for. But let's look at Math or Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 here, then we'll finish up. It says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. There you have the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, now if you are listening to this message, there's going to be a lot clearer teaching coming from Moses and Elijah. But if you're listening to this thing, and the rapture has happened, and you're a Gentile, by the way, you better, I mean, you'd be, you'd do good, you'd do well to get to Israel if you miss the rapture. And try to live among the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, and listen to Moses and Elijah when they show up. But right there, this is what you have to look forward to. Don't fall for the pleasures of sin for a season by taking the mark of the beast. Because that's an instant ticket to hell. Okay? You're going to have to make it through this time period. Okay? If you get into that. But look at verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Remember the law. The commandments of God. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Moses and Elijah are coming. And they are the ones that are going to convert those Orthodox Jews right now, the unfinished Jews. They will be completed, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be a very, very rough time. Don't let any of these apostates that are alive right now, the big modern church professing Christians, 
Don't let them mess you up by trying to take you back and tell you that you have eternal security and you can take the mark of the beast. Don't let them mess you up. So that's it for this morning. Uh, thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.